up, please. All right, are you seeing that? Great. So today, we've a lot's been coming at you. I know that those short videos contain a lot of information. So I want to focus you on three key ideas, not all the details, but three key ideas that if you apply them today, this week, this month, you will change the trajectory of your business. The first is finding and leveraging your super fans. We've heard a lot about this. I really want you to understand why it works and how it applies to what you're doing. Second idea in video one, the habit that the most successful innovators have is to test and iterate early in rough form. This can be really challenging. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They give it you know, lip service, but don't actually do it. And I wanna give you something very tangible and practical and tactical that you can use today that will help you with this. And then the third idea is to build engagement from the inside out. We talk about that a lot as a habit that not every game designer has, but the most su successful game designers do this. The most successful product creators and marketplace creators, they also do this. It's something that, it might be the most challenging idea, but honestly, it's probably the most powerful if you're looking at retention as your goal. All right, so let's start with that first one, finding and leveraging your super fans. So what this is really about, let me break down this diagram, okay? There's three steps, and I want you to think about how these steps apply to you. The first one is all the, see all those little people going into the, um, the funnel? That's screening. And in the Game Thinking book, I write about a specific kind of screener, the super fan screener. Six questions, three multiple choice, three open-ended, it's awesome. But I also, it's not the only way to do things. It's a great way to start. But I want you to also be thinking about what that means for you. What does it mean to screen your early customer cohorts? What that means is you have to get really specific about what a cohort is. The reason I say cohort there is there's, if you're early and you're figuring out who your product's for, you're gonna have hypotheses about who it's for. And if you niche way down and get specific about your hypotheses, you can usually subdivide them into cohorts. Right now, I'm doing this with two different private clients, and it's incredibly useful. If you work in the master class, we go into this very deeply and guide you through it. But just right now, just ask yourself, who are two to three mini cohorts in my audience who might be different forms of hot core early customers? How specific could I get? That's a big part of what makes this work. So you start by screening them and you screen them to see if they actually have the problem you're solving. And if it's top of mind, if it's something that they really um, think about and they're putting some action toward, that's what you're looking for, for an early customer. After you've done that, what comes out the funnel is actually iterative. The first thing that comes out the funnel is people to interview. You're gonna have, let's say you screen 200 people. There might be 25 or 30 in there that would be People you want to interview, they gave great answers to the questions, might even be 50. That's your second stage of screening. And from doing those speed interviews of a larger number of people, you can then generate insights, sorry. You can generate these insights over here. But this screener, this funnel also works for play tests. Once you've done the screening, out come your interview subjects, <coughs> excuse me. Once you've done those interviews, right? Those people become the people into the funnel and out of the interviews are gonna come people to play test. So let me make this really graphical. This is a two-stage funnel that gives you calibrated data that ends up with a very clean data set that is part of the secret of how you get speed out of this whole thing. So you start with the screener. And then when you get to the interview, there's fewer people that you're gonna be talking to, maybe 200 for the screener, 30 or 40 for the interview, something like that. 
But then after the interviews, there's a short, smaller number of people you're play testing, maybe seven to 10, something like that. And this two-stage funnel process, if you have the right guidance and templates can go very quickly. You can also, I encourage you to try this on your own because it's a bit counterintuitive. A lot of times you think, well, I want the most data points so I can get nice quantitative data. But it turns out that if you get early qualitative data in this form, you have these highly calibrated people that you're testing. And then through it enables you to do iterative play testing and development much faster. Now at both stages, you're gonna be distilling your insights from interviews and from play tests. Why is this so important? Why is this something that is such an important habit for success? It's because you can't wait for a big, long set of research to start building things and working with your team if you're building anything, even if you're very early. So what you need to do is you need to get customer insights into socialized into your development team as early as possible. And part of how you do that is doing speed interviews, get some insights, share them, then cycle back, do play tests, get more developed insights, share them, then do more developed play tests, share them. So it gets you into very much a loop where you're screening, interviewing, play testing, distilling insights. And the tighter you can be with that loop, the faster you'll move from MVP to engaging product. And it's the distilling of the insights that a lot of people skip over because they don't know how to do it. We walk you step-by-step step through that with job stories, but let me actually inspire you with a really specific example of why you want to do this if you're a product creator. So this is a real product, Covet Fashion, Dory Adar's favorite game. Thank you, Dory. Excuse me. He's one of our uh, wonderful um, assistant coaches and affiliates. So we did a bunch of research on Covet Fashion, which is a mobile cooperative game for women. And one of the patterns we discovered, we probably heard this 20 times in say 40 interviews, is that the um, we discovered that people really like to go shopping with someone else. We discovered that they'd say, oh, there's this friend and she tells me to put these shoes with that belt and I raid her closet and she helps me get dressed for important events. So I really need her input all the time. And we saw this pattern a lot. Let's turn that into a job story. What does that look like? That's the bridge between research and product. There's a trigger. The trigger for the, this job story is I need to get dressed for an important event. The activity, which is the second part of the job story is I want to raid my friend's closet and get feedback on my outfit. I want that, I want my friend to help me get dressed. That's what she wants. And then the outcome, the desired outcome is so I can have her accessorize my look and help me feel confident. Now it's that word confident that I want you to pay attention to. That's an emotion. This person wants to go on a journey from insecurity to confidence. That's a little mini journey. And you wanna look for those mini journeys when you're talking to customers. That's one of the secrets of successful innovators. And then build that into your game. Now let's take it a step further. How did that affect the game design? So in Covet fashion, those of you who played it know this. In Covet fashion, we have a shared closet. That's a game design feature. And what people said was, oh, I really love sharing and getting my friends feedback. We have a friend network in the game. And if you're friends with someone, you can actually build up your own closet um, using microtransactions. But you can also borrow stuff from your friend's closet to put together outfits. It actually is a very simple feature. It came right out of that research. It was so simple that the dev team was like, well, are people really gonna like that? It seems really obvious. Can't we do something more original, more creative? There was a lot of pushback on that mm -hmm. feature, but it came out of the research. We tested it in alpha, they loved it. And it's still in the game. It was one of the reasons the game turned into a hit. So I wanna pause for a minute and uh, I just wanna make sure that you guys are understanding this point. So can you post 
yes, I get it. Uh, if you have a question about this, just post into any chat. I want to make sure you're there. If you say, yeah, I like it, I get it, just give me a little feedback. All right. Hey, Samantha, uh, is there any, uh, any feedback there? All right, well, let's keep going. So, all right, so we saw our two stage funnel and we distilled these insights. And you see how that all works together. All right. Awesome, thank you. Glad you understand it. So you start this whole problem, this whole process by validating your idea in problem space. And this involves clarifying your product strategy. Now this is something we get into very deeply and guide you through in the masterclass. But for right now, you can do this right away on your own. Let me show you how Covet Fashion, the example I just gave you, did this, what that looked like. So these are two experienced game designers running a successful studio, Blair and Jeff. They, we wondered at the beginning of the project, who's the game for? We used the MVP canvas to clarify our product strategy. Before you find your super fans and leverage them, if you understand your strategy, everything will go faster, everything will go better. So our idea, which we were pitching to raise money on, was build your dream closet. Collect designer clothes, dress up for gala events, build a lustworthy closet of stunning outfits. It's an aspirational desire. The Kardashians were really big at the time on TV. This was the high concept pitch for the game. There was a, a sub-concept. In game pitches, there's also often a high concept and a sub-concept. Maybe you do that in your pitching too. The sub-context, was a very personal interactive, which is discover your personal style. Are you glamorous? Are you trend setting or are you more understated? And that was something you could also do. And the reason we had these two ideas at the beginning is we wanted to test them and see which one resonated or what combo resonated with our hot core customers. So we created an elevator pitch. This is uh, using the templates that you get if you're part of the masterclass. And we built we decided to say, okay, our pitches were building a free to play mobile dress up game with real world designer clothes. That's what makes it unique. For digital fashionistas, fashionistas 18 to 30 who love beautiful clothes but can't always afford them. So they can stay up to date on fashion in a much more pleasurable and interactive way than just reading Vogue. That was our pitch. And that's essentially what the game turned into. And we filled out the MVP canvas here around that pitch. Now, I'm gonna share these slides with you later so you can go over this in detail. But the thing I wanna draw your attention to is we had really two different ideas for who, who our early customers might be. Remember I told you about cohorts. This is where our cohorts came from. One cohort was female gamers. The studio had access to a lot of female gamers. And we thought, wow, maybe it's female gamers. And the kind who play, um, you know, uh, strategy games and casual games and who are just female gamers. But some early research told us it might not be them. It might be digital fashionistas who don't call themselves gamers. They might pick up Candy Crush or Angry Birds, but they would never say I'm a gamer. But they're heavy into fashion, but not gamers. So we, we actively tested both cohorts early in the testing. And the rest of this was quite similar, what they wanted, what we were gonna do. Our test was a four week beta test. We were gonna run a four week test really soon because we really needed to measure retention. You can really fool yourself by running quick tests that don't really have anything to do with whether you can retain people. So our core test was a four week, as early as we could, test of the core mechanics. So this habit of testing and iterating an early rough form, every hit I've ever worked on did this. And what it's really about is not falling in love 
with your beautiful vision, your best ideas, really finding out what's wrong with your idea as well as what's right with it. Now, there's a really well-established theory of corporate innovation called stage gate theory. Has anybody heard of stage gate theory? Type into the chat. Do you know stage gate theory? Do you practice it? Did your boss tell you about it? Stage gate theory is really great, really an interesting way of starting with a bunch of tiny experiments and a kill gate. See that kill gate? And so what you do is you say, I'm just gonna build something small and I'm not gonna put all my eggs in one basket. I'm gonna have several ideas and then I'm gonna have a metric of somehow to, to just let the best ones earn their resources. So the key idea here is let the best ideas earn their resources, learn how to do that well. This is what we cover in the Game Thinking Masterclass. So when you wanna test ideas, you want to set up the context. That's where those super fans come from. You want to know who you're testing, not just test everybody, but test people that you know who they are with your early rough ideas. Then you want to run some sort of test, not with the polished end result, but with something that's much rougher so you can find out what's wrong with it as well as what's right with it from a trusted set of calibrated people. So here's an example of how you can do that really low res. I was working with an esports company last year. And we had a very short time frame, and we, the engineers were busy. We needed to test ideas. So we spun up these um, storyboards, very rough. You can see how they're just rough, that showed like a sequence over time of getting messages and then having conversations with family members, like what you see here, and then more messages, and then just these rough drawings in an environment that they might be in. In this case, this is a company that holds gaming tournaments and movie theaters at off hours. And it's super cool. And so we had some new features we were releasing and we tested them in this very, very rough form. And we got incredible feedback that actually caused the company to change their business model just from testing it in this form. So the lower res and the simpler you can make things when you test, the better feedback you get if and only if you're testing with the right people. And then comes the debrief. And this debrief is something that the gold is there. The magic is there. The power is in the way you debrief after your test. So I just want to give you a few specific questions among the ones we ask. If you're doing this right now and you're like, yeah, I could really use some suggestions. When you're debriefing after early play tests, you can ask them, what stuck with you about that? Put the, put the visuals aside. What, what do you remember? What are you excited about? depending on what you're doing. That's a great question. Make sure to ask them in a separate question, what didn't you like? What was confusing or missing or concerned you or worried you? This is where issues like privacy issues, if you've got stuff where you're introducing people to each other, you can raise crucial privacy issues people might have with a debrief question like that. Ask them, what could be better? What did you see that you'd love to make better? It's a follow-up to the what was missing or, or wrong, if that's appropriate for you. And then a really great question to end with is who would you wanna share this with in your life? If it's a social product, you could say, who would you wanna bring in and be with in here? But if it's just something that is single player, they use themselves, you know, who would love this? Is it your mom, your friend, your coworker? And just those questions can yield gold if you're doing early rough play tests. So the third habit that we cover in the secrets of game thinking is to build engagement from the inside out. Now we're gonna cover this habit the most in the upcoming video, which is lesson three. So make sure that you watch that. You'll be hearing about it soon and you'll have till March 17th to watch it. This is all about zooming in on that learning loop. That's the habit building stage of your mastery path. This is game design in a nutshell but the kind of game design that empowers people versus manipulates them. And again, we go into that in detail and I'm gonna be doing an AMA Friday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, Shabbat Shalom, you know, with a glass of wine in hand that uh, you're welcome to come to and we're gonna dive into this one there. So that's a preview. But for now, what I want you to realize and see is that the punchline of that and the thing that you can take right now into your roadmap, to, into your work with your team, into your plans for bringing your visionary idea to life is that where you wanna start, the MVP you wanna build that's gonna get you where you need to go the fastest 
is going to be your learning loop. It's not going to be your onboarding made really beautiful. It's not going to be your discovery phase, which is a fake landing page, is, is MVPing discovery. And it's definitely not going to be all your mastery. People that aren't game designers or that are, pardon my language, crappy game designers, start with all the mastery. They get really excited about mastery and they build it all out and then it'll be there and here's the levels and then blah, 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 blah. I used to do that when I was a much less experienced game designer. I'm like full disclosure. I learned from working with Tracy Rosenthal and Greg Piccolo, La Piccolo at Harmonix and Will Wright and working with, um, you know, Jeff and Blair, I just showed you. I learned by working with those people that that's not where you start. You start with your learning loop. And then you have just enough onboarding to get your super fans in because they need less onboarding than your more majority people. During beta, yeah, you polish your onboarding and you continue to develop your loop. And then when you get to launch, you're introducing more mastery. You want just enough mastery. Don't overdo it. Again, that's a newbie move. Because think about World of Warcraft. They're always releasing new levels, new things, but they built a mastery system that would allow them to expand it. Okay, that was hooked into and meaningful with the core experience. That's how the pros do it. And that's what I want you to do too. This is exactly what's meant by building engagement from the ground up. So I want you to do two things now. One, on Monday, May 13th, we're gonna open the doors to the masterclass and we're having a live webinar. You can also watch the replay, I'll admit it, but I'd love for you to come live because I'm going to be offering you a complete walkthrough of what's in the masterclass, a really great short presentation that complements what you learned today about three massive mistakes that people make specifically on the front lines and exactly what to do to avoid them. Plus, you'll get some fast action bonuses for the masterclass only available live. So you can sign up and get a reminder. You can also just show up live. So uh, I hope that you'll join us for that. That's uh, gamethinking.io slash webinar. I also want to show you that if your brain got tickled by that MVP canvas, because mine sure does, and you thought, yeah, I want to fill that out for my, I would like to work on that with my team. I'd like to get started. Yeah, this is all great, but give me a tool. <laughs> Help me out. Yes, yes, yes. You want this tool? If you do, Go ahead and take our quiz. We have an innovator quiz and you will not just get this MVP canvas, you will get a customized cheat sheet specific to your situation, plus the canvas telling you how to use it to get success for you and your team. So if you're itching to get started, grab that download. The quiz just has five questions. It's really quick. I want to support you on your journey. All right, so I'll leave that up. But uh, I have a bunch of questions that already were sent to me. So I've got those queued up. And I want to start to see if there's any questions that we have here online. Uh, and then I'll take the queued questions if we don't. But I want to give attention to the people that are here. So we'll start with that. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and turn on my video. Hello. All right. So any questions? Does anybody uh, in the Zoom or hello, YouTube folks? Glad to see you. I hope you're enjoying my YouTube channel. I've had so much fun making that channel this year. It's fairly new, but uh, growing fast and we're super excited about it. And shout out to my Facebook peeps. Uh, love to uh, connect with you and remember, come to the webinar. So let's see, I'll check in. Samantha, any questions that are coming in? Let me check that out. All right. Jason asks, hey, Jason, how do you know if there's a demand or a need? That is such a good question. That's like the question, right? Market need. So the way, the best way that I found to figure out if there's a demand or need is to do some 
lightning fast customer research in problem space. So earlier I talked about start in problem space and the MVP canvas is the technique that helps you start in problem space. And so you, you, the way you find out as a need is first of all, you set your solution aside because that's pitching, right? But there's a way to ask the right questions. And the Secrets of Game Thinking four-part mini course actually tells you exactly how to do that. So go watch video too. It's awesome. So you figure out, you say, okay, who do I think might have a need? You start with, okay, who do I think has a need in the market? Then you niche down. You say, okay, I think it's 18 to 30-year-old fashionistas, okay? And then you say, okay, it's 18 to 30-year-old fashionistas who, you know, have a need for something other than, than have an unmet need, uh, would like something more interactive than Vogue and blogs, for instance. That was our supposition about an unmet need. And then you can uh, run screeners and interviews in problem space where you're not pitching to test that need. And if you, and you can totally do that on your own with the materials. We walk you through doing that in a two week discovery sprint that goes very quickly, but gets you the data you need, at least the first data. And so that's how you see if there's a need. If you're innovating, as Paul Buckheit wants to say, you wanna find something a few people really badly want, even if most people don't get it right away. So finding a need isn't about market sizing and isn't about lots of people wanting it. It's about finding a hot core of a very specific niche that really wants it. And using these techniques and making sure you stay in problem space is the best way to understand that need. Great. So, and we'll talk about that more in our upcoming uh, webinar. Scott asks, is it important not to give people a taste or idea of the mastery path before they join the habit building? Can that influence our ability to get people to start the habit in the first place? What a great question. Wow. So um, the answer depends on what you're doing. It depends on who you're targeting and what value prop they're there for. If you're building a game, if you're building anything where there actually is a mastery path, giving them a hint of the mastery path in the language of the benefit they get from the mastery path is not a bad idea, especially during discovery and onboarding. So I'd say even just light hints like that, in some ways it might filter people, but it would probably filter them in a good way. The thing to realize is at that point, you're testing your mastery path idea, right? Because you can give them a hint of it, but what if it's not very good, right? So you want to, you don't want to have too many variables in a test. You really want to, to keep it simple, that's basic science. You want to keep it simple and move one thing at a time so you see what's causing the problem or what's causing the greatness, right? So you can give them hints. Uh, there are times when it makes sense. Um, if you don't need to, if you don't need to give them the hints, you have a pure test. And if you can do that with and get people in for a test, great. M when I think about most of the clients I work with, what we actually do in practice, we go into this in, I think, week six and seven of the masterclass, is we have them do the discovery research, distill the insights and the job stories where you get this really distilled, actionable version of all that research data, and then sketch out a mastery path at the highest level, just so it's coherent. Most people outside of games never th really think about the mastery path for their app, but almost every app has one if you think about it. So what we do is give you a four stage template, have you fill it in with job stories and just sketch out a coherent customer journey that turns your customer into who they wanna be, whether it's building their skills, building their knowledge, building their relationships, just building their ability to get better at this fun app. There's a lot of things you can build inside of your customer, but you're always building out their mental model of your app or your game, or your marketplace. So the customer journey is about delivering an experience that gets better over time as your customer becomes better in some way. And it's also about building out your customer's mental model in a coherent way that feels like good storytelling. And that applies to apps and marketplaces and services and events every bit as much as it applies to games. All right. 
So let's see. Great. So there's, thank you. Um, thank you for that awesome question. And you too, Jason. So Scott, asked, another Scott asked, I'd like to hear an example of a screener question that's in problem space. It's kind of hard to imagine. That's a great question. So here's a really hot tip. A really good question in problem space often is going to revolve around behavior versus uh, attitudes. People often lie to themselves about, it's a lot easier to lie about what you think, but if you ask people to talk about their behavior and you ask and you embed it in time. So in the last two weeks, how many times have you done X? In the last six months, how many times has X uh, been important to you? X, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so here's a great example. I'm working with an awesome client right now who's, who's got an app for early Alzheimer's detection and treatment and it's launching in a pilot in Japan. And this, uh, we're working on this issue right now and struggling with it. And so one of the questions we all really like, because you're, you're looking for early adopters and early adopters are defined by their behavior as much as their attitudes. Yeah, it's, they have the problem, problems top of mind. They're trying to do something about it. They're not just sitting on their tuchas. <laughs> Hello, Yiddish people, you know what that means. They're not just sitting there thinking, ah, oh, I have this problem. They're doing something about it. They're trying, they're frustrated. So that's a really good question to ask that's in problem space. It has nothing to do with your solution. Are they trying to find other solutions? So you, here's, a, here's what you can ask. In the last two weeks, one month, six months, whatever's appropriate for you, uh, how many times, ha, you know, in the last six months, which of the following things have you tried? Which of the following uh, actions have you taken? That's what we said for the Alzheimer's detection app. And the actions in there were things like, I have, uh, you know, looked at my, gotten my genetic markers for Alzheimer's. It turns out there's a test and you can get genetic markers. I've searched for information on the internet on dementia. Um, I've cared for a family member with dementia. I've discussed with my doctor about memory health, et cetera, et cetera, a long list, 10 things. That's an example of problem space. So we said, check all that apply. And so, and we have some that are like, it's not really top of mind for me. I haven't done any of these. So those are actions that the people who are concerned about memory health would take. And they also, in those actions also embody what we know as a team about people's, um, what causes them to seek out solutions and apps, which is things like a family member having dementia or their doctor bringing it up with them. Another thing we had in there is, I've been forgetting things more and it's bothering me. That's one of the, and we added that based on some earlier research we did. So that's a, that's a great example. And that was a great question. So thank you very much. So another question that came in um, off our videos is a question about one of the examples in our videos and sharp-eyed uh, listeners and watchers may have noticed this. So one of the examples we use of how this whole program came to life is Play, which is a toy subscription company that um, actually was the very first company to use this eight week process for uh, applying game thinking to your project. And they got extraordinary results. And so, and they really, um, they were such a great team and they got, so, they really pivoted. They saved many months of time. They've recently gone out of business for reasons that had nothing to do with our work together. They were personal reasons among the founding team, completely inappropriate to go into any kind of detail publicly. But I decided not to pull all the play examples at the last minute because it was a really awesome experience and they got great traction out of that and they continue to get great traction growing their company. The real story is startups are friggin' hard, right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> startups, being an entrepreneur, growing your business, it's hard. Things happen. You know, life happens. Funding happens. I ran a startup. We made a lot of mistakes, but... We also were raising our second round in 2008 during the economic crash, things happen. So I think it's very powerful to not hide mistakes, but to be celebrating and discussing and reflecting on and dissecting mistakes. That's how you grow. So I, I struggled with this one, to be honest. I struggled with, should I hide play completely, scrub them and pretend they never happened? And I may at some point, because they're not that good an example anymore, but in reality, there's so much to be learned from 
you know what? This will increase your odds of success. Absolutely. But it's not going to guarantee it. There's your own execution. There's your own hiring ability. There's your own fundraising ability if you're going down that route. There's things that happen in your life that make it impossible for you to maintain the pace of running a startup. Can any of you relate to that? So uh, I hope so. I see Pat, Pat says, is there a fee for the masterclass? Absolutely, there's a fee for the masterclass. So I've been giving you, as you see, a huge amount of free learning. And I encourage you to, to take advantage of all this free learning. Today's AMA, Friday's, the webinar, the four videos, boom. The masterclass is 1997. It's a steal. It's an absolute steal. 1,997. So it's just under $2,000 and we have a payment plan. And on the webinar, so I just tell you how much it is. And on the webinar, we're going to walk you through all the details of the masterclass, introduce the payment plan and bonuses whose value far exceeds the masterclass that are for people that take action quickly. So um, I hope that you'll take advantage of that. We run the masterclass once a year. So, you know, there's a lot of marketing wisdom that says build up, build up, build it, don't reveal the fee, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? I'd want to know. So there you go. Let's see. So are there any more questions? Uh, so there's another question online. I'm going to go ahead and answer while I'm waiting to see if there's more, which uh, is, I'm an educator. Is the masterclass for me? Is this going to help me build better games-based learning? So the answer to that is yes. And what I want to do is introduce our uh, lead uh, coach. We have a special guest coach for our education track. So because of the amount of interest we've gotten from educators, from people that build uh, learning, learning uh, environments for corporations, for schools, we've got a lot of those people, including among our coaches. We've got Carl Cap. I've got um, Rob Alvarez is, uh, does that sort of thing in Spain, in Madrid. He's awesome and he's in our inner circle. We've got a lot of people that are signing up for the masterclass from the education world. So we have an entire education track this year. It, the whole masterclass is available to you, but we have a lead coach who's an expert in games-based learning. And I'm going to uh, bring him onto the video right now to say hello. You'll be seeing a lot more of him. Hey guys, Scott Kim here. I'll be the uh, uh, coach specializing in uh, education. And for the last five years, I've been using game thinking in all my education projects, working with companies like ABC Mouse, Think Fun to design uh, really engaging educational games. I've always had a passion for uh, education, wanting to do something. And uh, I tell you, even the, uh, I'm an expert puzzle designer, but uh, game thinking really shifted how I think uh, approach the design process. And I'm really, you know, I want to see education get better. And I think this um, game thinking, I'm really excited to help people use game thinking to make better educational experiences. Awesome. So that's your sneak peek of Scott. Thank you, Scott. So he's uh, going to be joining us uh, probably for the second webinar. Uh, and when you see the masterclass page, which will open up Monday, uh, you'll see all Scott's bio. You'll see what he's done. He's being very modest. Scott designed the puzzles for, let's see, Bejeweled. Perhaps you've heard of that. Pop It, perhaps you've heard of that. Moshi Monsters, perhaps you've heard of that. Age of Learning, he designed their next gen game. So um, Scott also recently created Math Mondays, which is games-based learning in school. He created it as a side project, a passion project. I bet some of you are working on passion projects on the side that you wanna turn into a revenue stream or wanna turn into something bigger. Scott's been doing that for the last year, um, incubating it. He brings a bunch of games into school and uses it to really reignite kids' love of math and reinforce what they're learning in the more rote math. Guess what? It's exploded. It's become a national program. The um, National Academy of Math has picked it up. They're going to be distributing it to teachers and to parents. You'll hear more about that later. But if you want to learn how to take your passion project and turn it into something that can grow bigger, 
that actually finds the right early passionate customers and delivers a compelling experience to them, you'll learn it from Scott and you'll learn it from me in the Games Thinking Masterclass. All right, so let's see, we, uh, we're gonna sign off shortly. Got a lot of stuff going on. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, you'll be able to watch the replay online and looks like that's it for the questions. Uh, this was so fun. I look forward to hanging out with you Friday night and on Monday in the webinar, seeing you online and hopefully welcoming you onto the fast track to product market fit in the Game Thinking Masterclass. Bye for now.